Well, I was always interested in science. I began as an undergraduate in biochemistry, but I'd worked during junior high and high school at the San Diego Zoo. So I was extracting DNA when I was 13. I went to veterinary school because I was interested in population science, the idea of human health and animal health being linked. So I just returned to science and I went to Harvard for a postdoc and then I went and did a PhD at UCLA. So I did a Fulbright fellowship in Ireland and I was doing what are called TMAs or tissue microarrays. That's when you take a tumor sample and you use digital technology combined with molecular methods to look at uh, the biology of the disease. And three of the major biotechnology companies that we now rely on were actually putting forth beta test versions of their products when I was in Ireland. So I was actually able to, to um, get experience with and try and use the products that we're now using in our study when they were introduced in Ireland first. So Ireland got me a five-year jump on our current study by learning that techniques and perfecting before we got here. So the Carolina Breast Cancer Study began in 1993, and we're currently in the third phase of enrollment in a study. As you can see from this map of North Carolina, we represent a large portion of the state, and the goal of the study is to stop breast cancer, to figure out why women are getting breast cancer, why they're dying of breast cancer. We're here in Orange County, but we have nurses that drive three or four hours down east to some of the poorest parts of our state, and by going to people's homes, we can get information that you would never get in a doctor's office, never get in a phone interview, never get in a mailed-in questionnaire. Jeannie Hopkins Lucas was the first African-American female senator in North Carolina, and she had a long history herself of visiting people in their homes. One thing that Jeannie did was to keep in contact with her constituents. The one thing I think we're doing in this study is to follow up on what Jeannie started by taking the pulse of North Carolina. Now we're focusing on breast cancer, but a lot of the questions that we ask don't pertain just to breast cancer. We ask about family history, we ask about other illnesses, we ask about access to care and treatment. We talk about people's education, their obstacles to care, and their interaction with the healthcare system. One important feature of the Carolina Breast Cancer Study is that we cannot take volunteers. It's not that we don't care. If people are interested in volunteering, they can come volunteer and help us with the study, help us with our materials, help us with outreach. But to enroll in the study, you have to be identified systematically. The reason for that is we want a systematic, unbiased sample of women with breast cancer in North Carolina. The only way to get such a systematic sample is by identifying women using a list from the North Carolina Cancer Registry. We enroll women at over 65 hospitals throughout the state and also some private clinics. And in each situation, the referring physician has to give permission to contact their patient. So we've had outstanding uh, contributions from these physicians throughout the state. It's been an amazing cooperative effort. I think the most challenging aspect of a population-based study is you've got to do two things. You've got to see the forest for the trees, but you've also got to be involved in the details. So the problem is that you're constantly dealing with detail, but knowing that you've got to put together things in the big picture. And what happens in a population-based study is the big picture won't emerge for three or four years. Now, fortunately, we've had three waves of data collection the big picture has come together twice. It came together in 96 with some papers we published, and it came together five years ago with some other papers that we published. So I think we're hoping that in three or four years from now, the big picture will emerge again and we'll be able to put all this data together again. So similar to this pattern that you see here of enrolling patients across the state of North Carolina, we use the same approach in a study of malignant melanoma, 65 counties to enroll men and women with melanoma. So we looked at three different types of melanoma, two that are more aggressive, a third type that's not quite as aggressive. And we looked at the role of sunlight in those different types of melanoma, and also how they play out in terms of men versus women and geography where you live during your life. Project LEAD stands for Leadership, Education, Advocacy, and Development. The idea behind Project LEAD is envisioned by Fran Visco, the President of the National Breast Cancer Coalition, was to secure a place at the table for breast cancer advocates when all funding decisions are made in terms of the DOD program, in terms of congressional funding for breast cancer, but also political decision making when laws or regulations are proposed that have an impact on cancer survivors, that cancer survivors should be there to have a voice. I think the best thing about being a project lead is what you learn from the participants. It's invariably every time that I go to a meeting of breast cancer survivors, I learn something. I've been involved in, in rowing since I was in high school. I think one thing I learned that's really important in athletics is to accept criticism. One example where it's important, when a breast cancer survivor comes and gives me a suggestion, it doesn't take much imagination for me to 
assume that A, that she might be correct, and B, that if, if she is correct, then I should listen to her. So I can tell you that getting criticism, usually constructive criticism for breast cancer advocates, has been a huge part of my study. So right now I'm involved in coaching crew, not as much rowing anymore, but as a coach, I think the thing that I try to emphasize is there's no I in team. That teams are composed of, of individuals that have opinions and needs and wants and abilities, but they have to come together and mesh to form a whole. That's what I try to do with our study staff. So try to recognize that each person on our staff has their abilities and try to maximize those abilities and have, have them work together as a team. I'm a 12-year breast cancer survivor and I currently serve as the enrollment specialist for the Carolina Breast Cancer Study. And I love my job because it puts me in contact on a daily basis with newly diagnosed breast cancer patients. And I get to tell them about what a great research study and opportunity it is for them to help us. Just by having Sarah and Kat Andrews and other women, part of our study changes the dynamics in the room. Having advocates in the room helps the research, helps the research be done better, but it also helps us take pride in our research and celebrate our research and realize it's important.